So hey guys, uh, as mentioned, my name is John, I'm a developer at Clovercore, and today I'm going to be talking about room scale VR, but specifically for really big rooms. When people talk about room scale VR these days, a lot of the time it's the Vive, maybe 4 meters by 4 meters, or Oculus Touch, maybe a little bit smaller. But what I really want to talk about is big spaces with wireless backpacks, headsets, 3 meters by 6 meters, 6 meters by 6 meters, that sort of thing. And to do that, I'm going to go through three projects we've built over the last year. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy. So first of all, who and what is Global Court? Uh, despite our name, we are not a corporation helping <laughs> on world domination. The rumor floating around the office is that it was easier to get a bank loan 10 years ago if you sounded like an evil corporation focused on world domination. <laughs> but what we really do is we build digital experiences for physical spaces. So what that means is we build tech interactives generally for conferences, trade shows, museums, miscellaneous retail showrooms in Abu Dhabi, or kind of wherever you might want to put a tech interactive over top of the physical space. Historically, we've done a lot of multi-touch walls, tables, custom electronics, and in general, whatever crazy interactives we can convince a client to pay us for. Because of that, the company has always been about finding new technology and using it to provide a unique benefit for our clients. So that means we're constantly iterating and a general mantra for every project of no matter what we're using, we're going to try and figure it out. Which brings us to VR. So a couple of years ago, um, I remember going in for my first interview at Globacore, which was right after CES, where that was being shown off, I think duct tape and all. And um, Ben, our co-founder and CEO, was talking about the fact that they were an early Kickstarter backer. He was... So excited about it, it was the first thing I think he mentioned as soon as I got into the office, which was more than enough for me and I was sold. And then a couple months later, in July of that year, we finally had it arrive in the office. And the big question is, what now? We've been, got the test me demo running, we found a roller coaster, but what do we actually want to do with this thing? Um, the first day, what we actually did was we grabbed the Kinect, we got an avatar going in that test me scene, and tried to make it so we could walk around a couple steps in either direction. Which, sure enough, the connect would lose tracking, my head would go shooting off four feet in either direction, and I would feel nauseous for the rest of the night. <laughs> but the point is, I guess, that from day one, we were really much, like, without realizing it, we wanted to build room scale. We didn't want to build gamepad stuff, we wanted to build a holodeck and actually experience what it was like to exist in a virtual space and be able to move around. Our first actual VR project was Paper Dude, which was about three and a half years ago now. And maybe some of you guys have seen it. It's shown up at, I think, FITC a couple of years ago. Floats around every once in a while. Um, the idea here was we've got a bunch of cyclists in the office, and we've also got some serious 80s game aficionados. So let's build a remake of Paperboy, the old Atari arcade game. Instead, let's use a real bike, let's use an Oculus, and let's use a Kinect to do throwing gestures. And this is what we ended up with. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, good freeze frame for that. <laughs> okay. Problem number one in my presentation. Um, yeah, so what it is, is you bike through a virtual neighborhood that's modeled after the game. It's like 8-bit graphics. You throw papers using these elaborate gestures. And you try to break, try to avoid breaking windows, but arguably that was always more fun anyway. And uh, you get points for successfully delivering your papers. It was a really cool experience for us because it meant, like, it was early in the days. If you did anything with VR, chances are it was going to show up on the blogs. So uh, we all, like, in the office, the first morning after we released our video was on The Verge. It was on Wired. It was on Gizmodo, and we've never experienced anything like that before. So we're kind of losing our minds. Um, but why am I really talking about this, and what does it have to do with root scale VR? Um, it is a good highlight for how we've always thought about VR in general. Um, we're really lucky with the space we get to work on that we get to build for specific events. We generally build something that is going to be live for maybe four to five days. We can use whatever crazy hardware we want, and we can make sure the space is very specifically set up for what we want to do. That means we don't have to worry about kind of those traditional concerns of like, oh, it has to go in this store, it has to be compatible with this hardware. We determine the spec, we don't have to really support it other than being on site and making sure it all works. But we can throw together a crazy bike trainer, a Kinect, and an Oculus DK1. We don't have to worry about supporting an Xbox One gamepad because that's what shipped with the hardware. So from day one, it wasn't about seated gamepad experiences. 
It was about trying to do crazier stuff. And through Paper Dude, we learned a lot. First of all, we learned how immersed people will get, especially when you're making them physically do something. Whether it's riding a bike or actually walking around in a space, people would jump off the bike as soon as a barrier got close to them. Like we were actually having to catch people every once in a while, which was a good lesson. Uh, the importance of an avatar. People want to be able to look down and see their hands and see that they physically exist in that space. Putting the UI in the world and the importance of being very careful, obviously, with acceleration and locomotion in general. So after this, one morning, the lady your screen so you're on the actual screen. Okay, uh, trouble. But um, have any of you guys heard of the void? Okay, so this video floated around. Um, what it was is it came across, came through our office. Everybody was kind of losing their minds. Clients were emailing us about it. But the big thing was, at least I personally, I saw that and I was convinced it was vaporware. Was like, no way this is real. But sure enough, a couple months later, they got an install at Madame Tussauds in New York, and they're building this stuff, and it really does exist. So how did it impact us? Uh, Samsung, for their software developer conference, uh, wanted to set up a VoIP demo. But unfortunately for both the VoIP and Samsung, they don't use any Samsung hardware in their equipment, uh, which meant that we got involved in the conversation in order to build something similar using a Gear VR, which was <coughs> lucky for us. So what we ended up doing was trying to build what we refer to as Escape Tomb VR. So it was a Mayan escape room using tracked physical props. Okay, maybe this will be the one. Yeah, um, I'm just going to do the lazy thing and just use Windows Explorer. Sorry, one second. <laughs> okay, so this is Denis, our creative director, doing our first test with um, our kind of prototype. So an important thing for us in any project is doing a functional prototype. So this was an Easter basket we bought from the dollar store, a single camera, and a coffee cup we fished out of the recycling. But what he is actually seeing is the Easter basket and the lantern that's illuminating the space around him, and the coffee cup was actually a golden idol. <laughs> okay. And best news of all, uh, that was about two weeks before the client visit. They came in and they liked it. It was half baked. It was the definition of a prototype. You could only walk maybe over here, over here, but it was enough that they got the idea and uh, we got the project. So this is kind of what the actual room itself looked like. Um, it was all built in Unity. It's all running on a phone. So this meant that we spent a lot of time on optimization. Um, there was a really interesting thing which we found a couple times with RoomScale. Is uh, I remember turning to Dave, the other uh, developer on the project, at the end, being like. Did you code a lot? Because I didn't write a lot of code. And you're being like, no, me neither. Uh, and what we kind of learned was, because we're using physical props, you're tracking stuff physically in the space, the user is responsible for their own locomotion, like, pretty much everything just happens in the real world anyway. So all you really need to do is just set up, when this moves to here, do something. But it was pretty much like the best physics system was just the real world, which was determining our physics, which was a really nice discovery for getting to build these things fast. Uh, the tracking for this was done using OptiTrack cameras. Uh, this is a motion capture system that's often used for mocap animations as well as the Void uses it for their stuff and starting to crop up with VR uses as well. The game itself was based around three puzzles. You have to complete the puzzles by rearranging the statues. We very much stole the staff of Raw from Indiana Jones and had to redirect the light beam. And then grab the uh, golden idol when it's revealed at the end of the game. This is uh, Ben installing the cameras. We mounted eight of them up on a truss above the space. And these are some of the props. Uh, we had 10 of them. Uh, the headset itself, gloves, a lantern, three statues, a staff, a gold idol, and an eye gem. So a neat thing for us was we actually got a prop artist to build all the props based on a 3D model we provided. So it meant that when you actually went to pick something up, what you physically felt in the real world matched up one-to-one -one with the VR representation, just with a different coat of paint, uh, which 
makes for a really natural interaction. Even when people can see the props as they walk in the space, there's always that little moment of like, wow, I can actually pick this up and it feels like the way it's supposed to based on what I'm seeing. This is what the room itself looked like. It's a little bit washed out, but completely dark room, three meters by six meters, and we used magnetic plates uh, to show where the correct locations for everything was. So if you actually picked up one of the statues to rearrange it, there were magnets, so it would kind of click into place where it was supposed to go. Same thing with the staff, which is a good way of providing that almost like video game level feedback in the real world. So people actually know they're on the right path and doing the right thing. Uh, the level was designed to match the walls one-to-one, -one, so you could actually reach out, you could feel the wall um, based on where you could see it in VR. And the key thing for room scale is if something's going to exist in the real world around them and they can't see it, it better also exist in VR. Because otherwise, people are going to walk on the walls, they're going to kind of just lose track of where they are. Yeah, so this was kind of the general setup. So we had this giant, big black room, uh, which nobody seemed to know what was going on inside it. Uh, we did this at the uh, SEC party, um, so this was during showtime. We had a line pretty much the entire show, uh, which was great. Um, and people, even after waiting for an hour, hour and a half, would come in, have this five-minute experience. And we were kind of expecting a little bit of, like, oh, we waited half an hour to try something for five minutes. But without fail, it was always kind of a positive reaction. We were really surprised at how many people were trying VR for the first time. And it was a pretty cool experience getting to tell people getting to show people a room scale project with physical props as their first VR thing. Okay, I'm just gonna play another video for you guys. It had gone through the, uh, the Galaxy S7 HDMI. VR that is actually running the game itself. The graphical fidelity of which was the best we saw running off of a phone here at the show. The position of rigid bodies, uh, their rotations and positions in the scene are being tracked by the cameras. And to differentiate the objects in the scene, white IR reflective markers are attached in unique patterns so they can be manipulated and reconfigured to solve the puzzle. Their Indiana Jones style puzzle uses a total of 10 tracked objects, including a lantern that provides more or less light to you in real time. Overall, the immersion was the best out of the demos we saw, and they even told us they had problems with people trying to run out of the room that they were trapped in once the door lifted and had to physically restrain people to keep them from barging into a physical wall. <laughs> so thanks for checking out our VR roundup here at the Samsung Developer Conference 2016. Don't miss any of our Samsung Developer Conference videos by checking out the applicable playlist. And if you're not subscribed to Linus Tech Tips, make sure you do that as well. Careful. Yeah, so what did we learn? Not surprisingly, that mention of people running out the door when the game ended was a big takeaway. <laughs> So having a wall that was also a door, and having that door lift up in VR, but still stay there in VR, not a great idea. <laughs> um, we faded it to black, but apparently not quickly enough. And um, especially if people are drinking, it certainly doesn't help. Um, <laughs> the main takeaway we had was people are just going to do weird stuff in VR. Like, you can try and predict it, but everybody's a little bit different. It's like the way people just go about their daily lives. You can predict it a little bit, but... You really just need to run a lot of people through in order to get a sense of how they're actually going to behave. And as I just mentioned, they're going to be a little bit weirder still if they've got a couple of drinks in them. Um, people will grab the idol. Uh, one guy grabbed it, cupped it under his arm like a football, and went charging for the room, which is how I ended up with uh, a beer all over me. Um, and we actually had to be very careful about like making sure people, like not restrain them, but make sure they didn't try and go through a wall or anything like that. Um, People in general are just unpredictable and they're unfamiliar with these experiences. Um, we designed this game a little bit too much for ourselves in the office. There's a lot of gamers. We want to use game mechanics. We want it to be a little bit of a challenge. But especially when people are trying VR for the first time, there's always that first, I don't know, 30 seconds to a minute where they've got their mouth slightly open they're just kind of looking around. Um, so one thing we need to keep in mind is that we need to simplify and we need a simple mechanic because we only have five minutes. It's not as if they're going to figure it out at minute four and then wait in line and then for another hour and do it again. 
Um, immersion itself, it's a tricky thing, because it's what you want to aim for. We want the most immersion we can have, but people will always forget what room they're in. Um, we were concerned that they would see us resetting the puzzles, and they'd know, like, oh, that object's tracked, that object's tracked, like, I know which ones to pick up and move around. But without fail, nobody did. We had somebody stand in the room, watch their two friends complete the game, put on the headset, and just stand there and say they don't know what to do. <laughs> which was great because it meant the immersion was working, but it was a little bit of us kind of looking at each other being like, really, you just saw this? <laughs> um, communicating these sorts of projects is very difficult. Like even a video doesn't really do it justice. Uh, you've really got to try this stuff, and even talking about it is harder. Uh, there's a quote from, I think, Chris Milk that floats around the office that is talking about VR as like tap dancing about architecture. And that it doesn't really work. You've got to try the things, and you've actually got to put a headset on somebody to actually get them to understand what they're doing. Instructions are a super important thing. Um, we used a lot of audio in this, so we actually had a disembodied voice behind the door that was supposed to be their explorer buddy that, that got trapped. Uh, so they were there to provide clues. So if you pick something up, you get a little bit of a, like, oh, like, there's notes about the gems. Maybe they need to match color and that sort of thing to kind of hold people's hands through the experience without making it too obvious. Another thing is that we realized we have to make sure we have people in the space at all times. In classic escape rooms, I think they refer to them as ghosts. Uh, but you want people there to just make sure things are going the way they're supposed to be and help out if people get really stuck. There's one VA who had a really neat idea of actually just shaking the props a little bit in people's peripheral vision. So people wouldn't actually notice that a prop was moving around. It would be just enough to draw their attention to it. And then they'd kind of turn and all of a sudden they have figured out the puzzle, even though they didn't necessarily remark that, oh, it looked like a prop was moving even though nobody was touching it. So from this project, the big question was, what can we do better and what did we learn? So this led us to the summer with a virtual code battle. So we did this for Intel at IDF in uh, San Francisco. And the main question, or the main thing we did to try and make it better is we can add a bunch of stuff to it. Um, another video, but... Okay, so this is actually a cool project. and less complicated at the same time. We took what we learned in terms of our escape tune being a little bit too hard for people to immediately strap a headset on and just understand. So we actually built pretty much a survival shooter. So it was waves of enemies coming at you. But we wanted to make sure people collaborated because we wanted this to be a multiplayer game. So we actually did it with uh, color coding. So what you would do is there'd be four kind of portals uh, spaced around, each of them a different color. And as a blue enemy comes at you, you have to go and you have to step on the blue portal, your gun turns blue, and then you can take out the blue guys. You go on the red one to take out the red guys. Which meant that the most important thing was communicating with your partner, saying that I'm going to take green and red, you take blue and yellow, there's a blue guy over here, there's a yellow guy over there. Um, so collaboration VR, as I'm sure most of you know, is a really big thing. Like As soon as you're sharing that experience with somebody else, is it really elevates it to something different. And with that in mind, we also added uh, some 3D scanning, which I'll talk about a little bit in a second. The other thing is we made it competitive. So it was collaborative as a team, but there was a leaderboard component, which means that people are always going to 
be super invested. You don't even need a prize. As soon as there's a leaderboard, everybody just wants to win because that's how people are. Uh, especially the guys who ended up winning, which were kind of two like frat guys from a miscellaneous university in the Midwest. Um, but it means people come back. Uh, if they lose their place on the leaderboard, they're going to line up again for 45 minutes in order to try and beat that score and make sure that they can claim their the champion of this project that lasted for four days. Um, we also incorporated a secondary game. So one thing with Escape Tune, and it comes up a lot with VR, especially in these conference situations, is throughput. If you put, like, it takes a certain amount of time to put somebody in a headset. Um, if it's a five-minute experience, you can only run so many people through. And you don't want, with Samsung, we made the mistake of it being completely closed off because we wanted it to be a bit of a mystery. But for this, we tried to do the opposite. We wanted it to be viewable out on the hall, and we wanted to have almost that Disney line experience where there's stuff to do, there's stuff to see. So we had a kind of guitar hero mechanic, which you saw there, which was actually impacting the game itself. So as you completed a task, you could actually trigger a special attack in the game, which meant that the teams that did the best were groups of four, or people who were chatting with the people behind them. Because it was really, even though it was two people in VR, it was really a team of four that was controlling the game itself. The other thing was it actually showed how the game was being played. So there was a level of training in that. Normally, we have to walk people through for 45 seconds to a minute of, this is what you're actually going to be doing when you put the headset on. And as soon as they get a headset in their hands, they're probably not going to listen to you. So anything you can do ahead of time to actually show them what they're going to be experiencing is certainly going to help. So for this, a nice thing was we don't have to use a phone anymore because it's not a Samsung project, which means we don't have to worry about optimizing. But we knew that there were VR backpacks floating around. So Ben started asking around, where can we get a VR backpack? Uh, turns out we can't. Um, so we ended up building some backpacks. This is uh, Ben impersonating Michael Jackson from Thriller <laughs> with a laptop strapped to his back. So this was our backpack. Um, it was a big MSI gaming laptop that ran hot on a metal plate to dissipate heat uh, with a custom like RC battery and a pouch at the front. Um, which, a little bit sketchy, but no problem. Uh, we were hoping we could just use the laptop with the power plug, but unfortunately the graphics card would throttle down because the battery wasn't actually supplying enough power, so that's why we needed the external one. Um, it was kind of fun because we had these little indicators to say when the batteries got too low, so every once in a while, like every half, hour and a half on the show floor, you'd start hearing an obnoxious beeping from one of the uh, backpacks halfway through the game. So it was a little bit sketchy, but a little bit more on that in a second. So this is the charger. This was my luggage, uh, which I was confident I was not going to be allowed across the border. <laughs> and doing this sort of stuff also means that Denis, um, who's sitting over there, is the night before soldering power cables on top of a road case because one of them has gotten frayed. So custom electronics can be fun, but in a show environment, it is always a bit of a risk. Additionally, we had a shipment of batteries that we were also convinced was not going to make it across the border. Um, but everything ended up fine, and what was actually funny was the booth next to us, they were demoing the Oculus, Oculus Touch, uh, and the Vive, and they had two backpacks from major manufacturers that were prototypes that were the things we were hoping to get. And the day before the show, we start smelling electronics for it, and I panic because I've got a 3D scan chamber set up with custom wiring, we've got backpacks with custom wire, people are soldering stuff. And we figure something's on fire, this is a disaster. And it turns out one of the actual backpacks manufactured by a proper PC manufacturer had blown up, and that was the smell that was coming from next door. So we ended up being the only booth at the show with working VR backpacks, despite the fact that they were the most homebrew things possible. <laughs> Additionally, uh, the client was Intel, so they want to highlight all the product offerings. So we needed something to do with an Intel Edison. So the solution is, why don't we just 3D scan people? So let's get 30 of them, and um, let's do 3D scans. So we can actually put people's heads on the characters in the game. Um, which added to that social VR component, because everybody wants a customized avatar, and if I'm gonna go into a game and I'm playing with a friend, it's pretty cool if the visor lifts up and it's like, oh, there's the head of the guy I actually went into VR with. A little bit of a closer shot. One more anecdote about the show, because this was a tricky one with all the different components. We did a final test one hour before the show, no good. Um, but sure enough, it was just Windows Firewall. So uh, this is the video from earlier, kind of going through the entire thing. 
But what did we learn about this one? Um, a big thing for us was how powerful collaborative games are. Uh, Escape Tomb was very much a single experience. And as soon as you can have people working as a team, like they love it. They're going to be engaged. They're going to be communicating. And there's a wow factor of it being social. And if you can look over, you can actually see the person that you are exploring the rest of the conference with. That's a pretty powerful thing. It was also fun to do this as a bit of a social experiment. Um, people would ask, like, how do I get a high score in the game? And we'd get to tell them the trick is to get to know the people behind you in line. So you have people starting up conversations because they want to kind of self-serve and get the highest score. But at the same time, it was kind of in the nature of a developer conference where you want people talking and you want them to be having conversations about what they do and why they're there. Another thing for us was we've done a lot of work with Intel. So they're a pretty trusting client. So we had a lot of flexibility to prototype this, change it, and actually it started out as a completely different concept altogether. Um, which is important right now in VR because we're all kind of still figuring a lot of this stuff out. So for us working in a lot of cases events and marketing, there's going to be an agency who wants these are the renders, this is what it's going to look like. But at the same time, that might be a bad experience. And you don't necessarily know until you put on the headset and you've built the thing. So functional prototypes early end up being huge. And for all these room scale things, we always end up using the vibe because we can plug it into the Unity editor and press play and we can get a general sense of how this is actually going to feel. And in this case, the actual functional prototype had enough in it that we used it as the core mechanics for the game. It didn't even really tweak it that much. Um, it's really important to involve people outside the headset. It's a little bit of a boring experience. People can't see what's going on. They're not invested in what's going on. So that secondary game was a big learning. And the other thing is we don't need to overcomplicate things. We had custom hardware outside the backpacks. Backpacks were a necessity, but we scrapped other custom hardware and we went with a simple game so people could understand it. They could put the headset on and they just kind of knew what to do. <coughs> Finally, competition. Competition always is going to get people engaged. If they think they can have bragging rights, they're going to keep coming back and there's going to be a line. You forget that we've been playing with these headsets for three years and most people still haven't tried one. So you want to keep game mechanics simple. You want something that is understandable. Most of the time, if people are, what's the, for us, this isn't in somebody's home. They're not going to put something on, get frustrated, and go back to it a couple minutes later. They've got five minutes, maybe two minutes, to try this out, and that's it. That'll be the one time they ever try this experience. So you don't want confusion. You want them to get it as soon as they put the headset on. Um, we have to be mindful of immersion. Um, people are not going to remember the room they were in. Uh, they're going to think they're in a completely different space. So if something exists in the real world, you better make sure it actually exists in VR space. Because otherwise, people are going to come out with bruises and unhappy. Um, make sure boundaries are obvious. If there's a wall, make sure the wall's there. Don't open a door unless that is actually a door that's going to open in VR. Um, and another thing with that is the role of ghosts in the space are important. You need people around to see what people are doing, make sure people don't wander into the play area, because people just do that for reasons beyond me. And also to provide hints as necessary and kind of force them to look in the right place and just help them along a little bit. A big thing for us is, in general, when I tried the Vive, I remember being a little bit annoyed about the tether, but not thinking it was that big a deal. As soon as you try something that doesn't have wires, it's pretty amazing the difference it makes. There is that thing where it just does flick a little bit of a switch where all of a sudden you are a little bit more immersed than you are for you. don't have to be thinking about it. So not having wires is a big win. And another thing is, we've got all these teleportation mechanics, we've got game pads, and people are navigating through things like their first person shooters and everything else. But at least for room scale, if you can do it, and a lot of the, in a lot of cases it requires the space, but the best locomotion is still just walking around. Um, you want these things to not exist as a video game, you want it to be a world. And anything you do that is a little bit outside of the ordinary of what you might actually be able to do, sometimes that's good, but being able to teleport around, that can kind of break that a little bit, rather than being able to walk over to something and physically pick it up. Um, this is a blank slate right now. We've done games, we've done single player, we've done multiplayer, and we've done like linear experiences. And you can pretty much do anything with it. And this is one of the fun things for us about the Samsung opportunities, is we can do a core game, and then we can turn around and make a multiplayer experience, where we can make a single room toy assembly factory. 
Um, and even now we're starting to move away from games for some of our things and do things like a digital museum where you can actually see different artifacts and as you pick them up it's going to trigger a specific story. Uh, the other thing is the best physics system is the real world. The best interaction is interacting with physical objects. Having menus in VR and reaching out and just touching the air isn't very rewarding. But if you can go and you can physically pick something up, it's always going to, it's still just a wow moment for people. And it just feels better. It feels like magic in a way that a basic UI doesn't. Uh, and the most important thing for us is still just to experiment. Um, we always make sure to build prototypes. Um, we can never know how something is going to feel until we put the headset on and really try it out. And one thing we've noticed is there's all these crazy problems people talk about with VR right now. It's locomotion, it's something else. But there's always going to be solutions, and this is kind of the time to find them. Just prototype and try stuff out. We were amazed with the portals that, like, you know what, this actually works. We're going to use this again, and it's a thing. So just try stuff out pretty much. Um, so what's next for us is we've got some more of these going on. Uh, we've got the Samsung Holiday thing, which is a kind of simple toy matching assembly game. And we've graduated from our home-built backpacks to actual backpacks. And we're going to be using these uh, for three, uh, two projects at CES and uh, one for the auto show. And what's awesome about this right now is we're doing this work. Initially, it, was, it felt very specialized. It's only going to be a rare opportunity. But we're finding even over the last year, it gets ramping up. We're doing a ton of this stuff, um, which is great. It means there's interest and like if encourage anybody who wants to get into the space. Like it does feel like the work is there and the opportunities are there. And that's about it. But I always like to include this at the end just because it's a fantastic photo. <laughs>